Thank you. I want to thank Julie Borlaug and her mother Jeannie also for being here and helping us celebrate the legacy of Norman Borlaug. We are honored to carry out Julie's grandfather's legacy through this dialogue next. We know your grandfather would be very proud of the work that you're doing to preserve his legacy. Julie, we look forward to seeing you back on this stage at about 2.30 to host another panel that will be focused on women in agriculture, technology, and innovation. And I would encourage people to submit your questions through the QR code that's on your table. And now I am very pleased to welcome three very distinguished leaders to the stage. Senator Debbie Stabenow, a senator from Michigan, chairwoman of the Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry, and Senator Joni Ernst, Joni Ernst, who's a dear friend of mine, senator from Iowa, and a member of the Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry, and Assistant Secretary Ramin Tului, is Assistant Secretary of State for Economic and Business Affairs, U.S. Department of State, who will also serve as facilitator for this conversation. Their discussion will focus on strategies for building a strong future in agriculture that is sure to be informative and inspi inspiring. Please join me in welcoming these three exceptional leaders. We're very honored and very proud to have them here for this discussion. So please come up. Ambassador Brent said thank you for that introduction and thank you for your leadership at the World Food Prize. Uh, thank you also to Michelle Hussein, who's uh, also and her team who um, have just designed a great day here uh, on a fantastic theme. Uh, it's my privilege to be up on this stage uh, and uh, to be with two women leaders, uh, just period, but in particular in the area of agriculture. So thank you for coming today and Thanks. thank you for enjoy, uh, sharing your insights with this, uh, with this uh, audience. Um, the focus of this session is really to, to discuss the bipartisan view and hear from you on some of the work that you're doing, including on the Committee on Agriculture to uplift women's voices in agriculture and craft policies and programs that improve women's health and promote innovation, expand opportunities, and prepare U.S. farmers for the future. Um, the, uh, I, I also want to say, by virtue of introduction, uh, Ambassador Branstad introduced the roles that uh, Senator Stabenow and Ernst have on the Agriculture Committee, but I also want to say that Senator Stabenow, when she was uh, elected in 2000 and has been a senator since 2001, was the first woman senator from uh, the state of Michigan. Uh, and Senator Ernst, <laughs> when she was elected in 2014, became the first woman to serve in federal office from the great state of Iowa, my home state and became the first female combat veteran elected to serve in the U.S. Senate. And so you're hearing today not only uh, about their enormous expertise in the field of agriculture, but uh, also uh, some enorm uh, enormously consequential life experiences. So in that spirit, let me um, start by asking, what initiatives from a policy perspective uh, do you support to encourage and assist young farmers, women farmers, 
and those from non-traditional backgrounds who want to enter and succeed in the field of agriculture and food systems. How can we best empower, reach and empower women in agriculture? And Chair Stavonell, let me start with you. Well, thanks and good afternoon. It's wonderful to be here with Senator Ernst. Uh, Joni and I work together on so many different things, the bioeconomy, how do we make sure that Americans own American farmland? I mean, so many uh, different areas. And I'm, I'm so appreciative of all of you being here. Uh, I'm not from Iowa. I feel like I'm in this <laughs> distinct minority today, not being from Iowa. But, but I am and have been seriously a, a huge uh, fan of Norman Borlaug's and and have lifted his name up so many times and so appreciate what what you are doing through the World Food Prize and uh, particularly as we talk about how we expand opportunities in agriculture. Um, I grew up in a small town in northern Michigan. I was a town kid, but my relatives were out on the farm. Um, and I've always believed you don't have an economy unless somebody makes something and somebody grows something, which is what we, we do in Michigan. And women need to be. We are more and more engaged in that leadership. But part of what needs to happen is to make sure our policies, we do a five-year farm bill. Every five years, we take a look at various policies to support farmers and then make decisions on how we can do more to create opportunity. In the last couple of bills, particularly in 2018, we made permanent something that I had been really pushing for in terms of extra support for beginning farmers, women-owned farmers, veteran farmers, you know, had, um, underserved farmers of color, what we have dubbed BIPOC farmers, to create more opportunity. Part of that, though, is also supporting not only our larger farms, which are very important, but smaller farms, urban farms. One of the things that we found, certainly coming out of COVID, was supply chains breaking down. It's how important it was and how much people wanted local food. And so creating opportunities for women to be engaged, whether it's a small urban farm, whether it's part of a larger farm, that our policies actually support them. Um, over the years, we traditionally move and move to create more opportunities from what had been sort of traditional farm bill policies really focused more on larger enterprises and so on. To be where, so we're moving. We've made a lot of steps to create you know, opportunities for everyone. And I think whether you're looking at something called crop insurance, where you pr provide an extra incentive or a discount on buying, if you are a beginning farmer, mm -hmm. or if you are a woman getting it, or, or a person of color, in every area we should be looking at how we can create more incentives. And so that's part of the debate that we go through every five year on the Farm Bill. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Senator Ernst. Oh, and, and thank you as well. And it's great to be here uh, with my friend and colleague, Debbie Stavanow, and, and the initiatives that we have in the Ag Committee are really thoughtful. And I appreciate that, Debbie, very much. And, and thank you, Secretary. Uh, there are a number of, of ways that we are trying to involve more minority groups, more women, younger people. Uh, one of the ways is, um, and if you think of the saying, if you can see her, you can be her, um, making sure that we do have women in agriculture that we are highlighting. And we had an effort just this last week during National Ag Week where we passed a National Women in Agriculture Day resolution highlighting the roles that women play in agriculture. And we're not just talking about the activities on the farm. It can be in labs, in the laboratories. It can be in that research and development. Uh, it can be in agribusiness as a, an ag lender. I mean, there are so many women that are engaging in the agricultural space and we need younger women to see that and to know and understand that there is opportunity for them in that sector. Um, so we did this, all of our women senators joined in in that resolution, all were co-sponsors. And so we were able to get that done in short order to highlight women in ag. We're also trying to bring more young people 
into the fold. And I think about my dad. I grew up on a farm in southwest Iowa, a uh, hog, uh, soy, and corn mm. operation. And, you know, my, my, this was years ago. Um, I'm not a young lady. Uh, my dad is one of those retiring farmers, um, and he's well up into his 70s. Uh, so you think about the aging population within our ag communities, and many of our younger people are choosing not to engage in agriculture. It's a very stressful occupation. Many of them will choose to go on. Um, there's one brother, one, one son in my family, my little brother, he chose not to go into farming. He works for the railroad. It was my older sister that took up the mantle of farming. She and her husband are now the ones that are farming our family operation. Um, but the young farmers out there, 35 years and below, we just need to make sure that they have access to capital. So one of the ways I'm supporting that is really pushing a, a modernization effort for what we call our Aggie bonds. And those are uh, grant and loan opportunities through our states that will allow young people to apply for monies in order to purchase equipment, which is over the top expensive. Um, you, if you look at the price of ag land in Iowa, holy cow, it is through the roof. Um, so it is very expensive to begin or own and operate your own farm. Uh, so there's a number of ways that we can encourage younger people to engage, but you know, right now the median age of a farmer is 58 years old, and we've got to find additional ways to get young people engaged and keep them in the rural communities and on the farm. So there's a lot of ways that we're engaging. You know, I was going to jump in, just Please. pull back to international for one second because we were talking before, before coming up here. By the way, amen to say everything that Joni said. Um, but let me just back up and say uh, this is an issue not only in our country but around the world, mm -hmm. as we know. About 10 years ago, I led what is still the only all women senators travel. It's called CODEL, Congressional Delegation Travel, and we went to Africa. And we focus on women in agriculture, women's leadership, women in, in health. And I know no one will be surprised, but women were doing all the work, leading the co-ops, <laughs> doing everything, right? Uh, but had no property rights, no inheritance rights. And so we met with the leaders, you know, the male leaders on one side, we were on the other, to talk about how you want real economic development in your country? You know, empower women to own their own land own businesses to be part of this. And so I mention this only because what we do here is very important around the world as well. We came back and AGOA, which is the African Growth and Opportunity Act, was uh, being debated in the Senate. Senator Maria Cantwell and I on the Finance Committee took our experiences from being in Africa back, added some provisions to AGOA specifically focused on women opportunity for women. Now this is going to be coming up again for reauthorization mm -hmm. and we are talking about the importance of seeing how we're going, uh, what's happening here in terms of women. So we, um, we want to make sure women are in leadership in Michigan. Uh, it's also important to make sure women are benefiting from the, the work that they are doing around the world and every country would be better and have more economic power if women uh, had uh, control over the work and benefited from the work that they did. This, um, I mean, this point just comes up whenever we're engaging on issues of economic development, and it even applies to advanced countries uh, that are not there. There is not enough. If there were higher female participation, everyone would be better off. And mm -hmm. agricultural sector, especially in poorer countries, is just so important. Uh, another issue we were talking about before coming out was. Uh, biotechnology yes. and the importance yes. of innovation, especially for confronting the challenges that agriculture is increasingly facing from a changing climate. Mm -hmm. So, Senator Ernst, what are the key policies we can pursue to, um, to support oh. and encourage innovation? My goodness, and this is where I am so blessed to be from the great state of Iowa. Um, we have our wonderful land-grant university, Iowa State University. It was the first of the flagship 
uh, land grants in Iowa. And there is so much research and development that is done at the university, whether it's through the College of Agriculture. Um, it can be on the fertility and health of soils, um, clean water initiatives, um, all the way to renewable fuels and uh, how we can apply that across the board here in the United States. So one of the latest initiatives that I'm engaging in is taking these bioproducts then, which could be a biodegradable fork or spoon, and developing that from soybeans, from corn, from other renewable resources. So there are so many different areas and just pro health and, and health products, um, beauty products. There are so many things that can be developed by utilizing the oils that are derived from soybeans or corn or other ag products. But we've just got to focus on uh, really pushing uh, investment into these areas. Uh, I think that we have just scraped the surface when it comes to all of the types of products that can come from uh, the sources that we have right here in the United States that we are growing every single year. So that's one of the latest initiatives and making sure uh, as a way to encourage growth in this area is that the federal government purchase more of those types of products. So not only are we supporting agriculture and our farmers uh, across the United States, but then we're also investing in products that are biodegradable and more earth um, climate friendly. So a lot, again, a lot of research and development done out there. I know many other great universities and, and organizations are focused on this, but Iowa State has really been a leader in so many of these types of products that are just better for the earth. Mm -hmm. Well, first, let me say Michigan State University is a great. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Go green. Anybody here? I mean, oh, right. Oh, I feel so much better. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, the truth is our land grants, and certainly Iowa um, and Michigan State, are, are very powerful and, and do wonderful work. But I think we need a real moonshot in research. I mean, I think so much more than I wish that, that you know, than we have resources. I've approached the National Science Foundation and we put more money in through chips and said what but agriculture is not on the list of right. what really could be used there so we I, in every area I think we need more um, in research Norman Borlaug certainly showed us what happens when you are intensely focused on increasing yields in research um, and so on and we need to base it on science 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 so and by the way the climate Crisis is real, just science. <laughs> so just for that, you know. So, but the um, the uh, but I, just to add to what Joanne was saying in terms of the bio-based economy, because I think this is a huge opportunity uh, for our farmers to add value and for jobs in rural communities. Back in 2014, I put into the first farm bill that I led what we called the uh, Grow It Here, Make It Here agenda, which was all about biomanufacturing and increasing the, the bio-preferred label of which we need to be doing even more on. And now you fast forward uh, and we've got about four million people working in the bio-based economy and we need to do a lot more. There's no question about it. Um, but there is so many, there's so many ways. I mean, when I introduced the, the, uh, that initiative then, I was working with the auto companies who had been contracting with Lear on doing bio-based foam, soybean foam, yep. in, in the seats of the cars. Mm -hmm. And so we were going around and I was talking about, you know, there's soy-based foam in the seats of the vehicles and they gave me one of the seats to carry around. And I was like, this has <laughs> soy-based foam. And so it's grown here. And not only that, but if you get hungry, you got something to munch on. So, <laughs> but it was a, but it was a whole eye opener. And as Joni talks about corn-based products, whether it's, it's um, materials for t-shirts or, or fo you know, mm -hmm. forks and spoons and uh, plastic. If you go, over the, again, back to automobiles, we, we do a lot of automobiles in Michigan. The, the cup holders are, are, in most of the vehicles now, are bio-based. So you've got corn product in the cup holders and, and in the dashboards mm -hmm. and in the seats. So 
there's a huge opportunity, mm -hmm. huge opportunity around science and on innovation that will help our farmers have additional revenue, frankly. We need to give them multiple ways in which to be yes. um, having revenues to be able to succeed and stay on the farm. Mm -hmm. You both mentioned uh, universities, and I know my experience is whenever I travel and I meet with students in universities, that's typically what makes me more optimistic and excited about the future. Because yes. you yes. have you know, students who have uh, this belief that we can solve the problems if we think about them in new ways. Um, I'm wondering, especially given the focus of today and increasing the role of women in agriculture, what are some ways in which we can get women more interested in science and technology to be part of this, you know, this innovation, the, the cycle of innovation? Well, I think, first of all, I think we are seeing more women interested in general in science and innovation, they may not think of agriculture. And so that piece of it, I think, is really, really important. When I talk to farmers in um, Michigan about what are your needs, workforce needs, of course, the folks, particularly folks um, that, that need someone working during harvest time on the farm or dairy farmers certainly need people that are uh, year round with them. But what I frequently hear is we need people that know technology we need somebody who knows GPS. You know, what we're doing is all related to technology and computers and GPS and so on. And so you don't sometimes, I mean, you don't see young people interested in agriculture thinking about that. And so I think for young women to be able to say, when you look at, you could be an engineer, chemical engineer, you could be a materials engineer, you could be an agricultural engineer. And, and look at, you know, because the food industry is so basic and so critical to um, all of us. And, and in a whole nother way, also, food is medicine. So there's a whole nother debate going on around um, health, health and, and how we eat and what it means in terms of medicine. And so creating those opportunities, I think, at school and opportunities for young women is really important. Mm -hmm. Senator Bozeman, who's our ranking member on the, the Agriculture Committee, and I uh, co-chair caucuses for FFA, Future Farmers, and for 4-H. Uh, I grew up in 4-H. In and um, so, but exposing new kinds of things to young people, mm -hmm. not just traditionally what you think of as FFA or 4-H, to really extend that out. I think is really significant. The other thing that I will say is we fund through the Farm Bill um, 1890 schools, very important for our schools to bring in, again, students of color into the process mm -hmm. um, and to create broader opportunities for people who are not uh, in leadership right now. So that's really important too, so. Yes, uh, and this, this is an issue when you have 2% of our population producing food mm -hmm. for the other 98%. And we have seen this, just the shift away from agriculture, away from the farm, at least the population. Those population centers aren't in rural America. They are very uh, centralized in larger metropolitan areas where they may never ever see uh, a cow. They may never see beef cattle or a hog. Um, they're not exposed to poultry. They just simply think their food is coming from a grocery store. Uh, so we, we have to expose people uh, to where their food comes from. And once they know that, they may be more excited to engage. I know even in Iowa, the, the governor, Kim Reynolds, uh, she has a huge STEM initiative. And it does focus on young girls and exposing them to all different pathways in life. So just as, as Debbie said, you know, if you're an engineer, you know, if you are a scientist, but how does that apply now to the farm and agriculture? Mm -hmm. But exposure is key to that. They've got to know that something exists out there to want to go into it. So we really have to show the way for some of these young women to engage. But again, 
Um, so many folks have moved away from the farm. We mm. just need to encourage them to get back. So those are some of the initiatives uh, where we are engaging, like I said, the Aggie bonds and some of those other things. But to Debbie's point, I think it is really important to have those 4-H clubs, the FFA, in our major metro areas because that's one way you can get some of the information into an area where you typically are not producing farmers or ranchers. Mm -hmm. well, you know, one other, I was just gonna add one other thing related to that, talking about urban areas. That's one of the reasons why the school gardens we do mm -hmm. are so important. School gardens, community gardens, um, so that kids can see that they're, it, you know, the, the uh, food isn't coming from the grocery store, they're growing it. And the more they're into growing it, the more likely they are to eat healthy mm -hmm. as well. I was at one a wonderful school in Detroit where they not only had a school garden, but then the kids decided to do a solar-based watering system. It was very cool mm -hmm. that they did. You know, so, so again, you, you create opportunities. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, very consistent with that, there is this consumer interest in locally grown food Absolutely. and community farms. Um, are, there, are there things that the government should do to help support that and create more opportunities for, you know, whether it's women farmers, other farmers to get involved in this trend? Oh, goodness, yes. There's all kinds of things that the, the federal government can be involved in, and I would also say state and local government as well. Um, one that comes top of mind is an initiative that I have, which is making sure that farm fresh foods are available at our farmer's markets and can uh, go to the WIC or use the, the WIC program to purchase those farm fresh foods. So, you know, your women, infant and children mm -hmm. program, making sure that they have access to those foods that just came directly from the farm. They can go to their local farmer's market and explore the different types of foods that are available. Iowa has probably 200 or more farmer's markets. Uh, across the state. Uh, we have one of the, the greatest concentrations of farmers markets in the United States. And it is because we have such a vibrant and thriving ag industry, not just large scale ag production, but also those smaller family farms where they may produce melons or um, radishes, asparagus, whatever it might happen to be. But those are the foods that end up um, being integrated into your local school system through various programs or into the local farmers markets. And it's a great way to expose people again that maybe don't have an agriculture background, but they may go to the farmers market and help their parents pick out you know, various types of produce for their family table. Mm -hmm. So there's a number of ways that we can be involved. I would always say it can't just be the federal government alone. I think it's so many different layers of community involvement, state, state government involvement, and federal government involvement. I think this is one of the really exciting areas of expansion to create markets, frankly, for farmers as well. We know we need international markets, we need trade, but if you can create a market across town, mm -hmm. if you can sell to the local hospitals, if you can sell in partnership with the local schools and create markets, those are also markets. And, and so, and we've started, uh, I think the real foundation has been farmers markets, mm -hmm. which are so, so very important. And, and then now expanding out to small urban farms. In 2018, we set up the first urban agriculture office. And so now supporting those farmers to be able to get started, is it is a little different. And frankly, if you're in a city, there are city ordinances you have to address and cities sort of trying to figure out how do we do that, you know? And uh, in fact, the, the mayor of Detroit now has decided because of the opportunity after multiple years of folks working to actually set up his first urban agriculture uh, coordinator for the city to be able to address um, different needs that that urban farmers have, or you know, it it uh, takes a, a little bit of a of a different approach, but um, but it's very important. I think c customers, consumers want to know where their food's coming from. There's a, a market again. It's not it's not small 
and not having big, but it's expanding out so that we have small regional operations um, as well. We're also finding, um, and Joni was talking about WIC, this is so important, fresh fruits and vegetables being available through WIC. We also started, this was something that actually started with a Kellogg Foundation grant a number of years ago in Michigan, something called Double Up Bucks, which has now become very, very successful, where if you are getting uh, food assistance and you buy at a farmer's market, you get double the value of your dollar if you're buying fruits and vegetables, because fruits and vegetables traditionally more expensive. And so this started as a, a pilot uh, in Metro Detroit with a group called Fair Food Network, was so wildly successful that we put it in as a pilot in 2014 Farm Bill, so widely successful, and grocers wanted to be able to use this too, that now it's permanent part of uh, the Farm Bill and something that I think we all benefit from by continuing to expand, but encouraging healthy food, mm -hmm. fruits, fruits and vegetables. And they just did a, a survey which was fascinating to me, where people on SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, eat more fruits and vegetables than people who aren't, mm -hmm. which I thought was very fa uh, fascinating. So the, the incentive, the support, to help people, and again, this goes back to food as medicine and healthcare costs and just all the ways in which all of this ties together. I think it's so significant. Yeah. Let me uh, uh, go back to the global context. We've yes. had all kinds of challenges in recent years with global food security. Mm -hmm. The climate change, conflict, COVID all disrupted the global food systems and we've had so many more people around the world at risk of, um, of uh, extreme food insecurity. I'm interested in how, from your perspective, on the positive side, we in the United States have been the global leader in providing international food assistance. Um, I'm interested in, from your perspective in the Senate, what are the things that are most important as the U.S. is engaging globally to try to combat malnutrition and combat food insecurity? Mm -hmm. We have a very important role to play in the United States. Um, I happen to think it's a good idea that, that we care about people and care around the world. And, and um, in the Farm Bill, we have certainly international food programs um, that we fund. We also fund commodity programs for our farmers to directly sell, which is, again, markets for them and really important for people. Um, Senator Bozeman and I reached out and asked Secretary Vilsack to expand or use uh, monies from a fund he has, the Commodity Credit Corporation, to create more food purchases. And they committed $1 billion to do that, working with all of our commodity groups. They're about ready to announce that, working with USAID, but it's our farmers uh, being able to sell abroad and be able to help with what's happening in terms of uh, the food crisis. So that's very important, as well as the other ways that we fund uh, and work with other agencies on Food for Peace and other, other agencies um, as well. So it's, it's, I think it's really important that, that we have a, a role there. One out of four children internationally uh, who are under the age of six are severely sever malnutrition, uh, malnourished. And so um, I, think, um, I think it's great that the United States plays an important role in that. Yes, and there are so many ways that we can get our products out there, and we need to engage more. And, and I have been pushing uh, our U.S. trade rep, Catherine Tai, and uh, and USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack to really engage more in this space. We need to develop those new markets. We need to continue pushing out to the markets that are already in existence. Uh, one of the bipartisan efforts that we have is the Market Access Program, uh, which helps us uh, market our ag products overseas. We really want other nations to see what we have to offer and then engage in that trade. Um, there's also the foreign market development program, again, you know, developing markets in new areas. Um, we need to invest more in those types of programs so our ag products can get out the door into other nations. We also need to make sure that 
uh, we are pushing back on the countries that are not honoring our trade agreements. And we have seen that um, with uh, Colombia and poultry products, I believe it was, uh, with Mexico and GMO corn, um, all of these things. It needs to be science-based. Uh, Brazil has incredible tariffs on our corn ethanol. Uh, so we need to make sure that when they don't honor agreements that we are taking actions to counter that. And it needs to be science and evidence based when they are disputing those trade agreements. So we do need to do more to protect our farmers and ranchers and make sure our products are getting out around the globe. Um, if, if we look at this, and I know I've talked about this in the past at a, a number of these forums, um, but food security is national security, not just in the United States, but for our friends and allies are all around the world. And if we look at what's going on in Ukraine right now and the fact that the war has disrupted their ability to get their grain into the markets that they normally support, whether uh, it's grain going into Africa or other parts of Europe, there are real challenges there. Uh, so if there are ways that we can assist in that movement, that's really important. Um, with a military tie-in as well, and Governor Branstad knows this because he oversaw our great Iowa Army National Guard for many years as governor, but during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, Iowa actually sent a number of agriculture teams. Um, men and women of the Iowa Army National Guard that were engaged in agriculture at home. And they were able to put together ag teams that would go forward into, say, an area of Afghanistan and then teach local Afghans other types of farming other than poppies, um, ways they could support their family without having the Taliban tell them, you're going to raise poppies and produce opium. Um, so there's just different ways of engaging. So the, you know, we're getting our products out there, but also teaching others uh, how to raise their own food, how to be sustainable, how to support their own families without being reliant upon one country or one faction or another. I think the work that we do in agriculture coming from the United States yep. is so incredibly important. And I know we're, we're very yep. proud to be part of that. Mm -hmm. I can just say on, on behalf of the State Department, the priorities that both of you articulated are very much uh, priorities for us, making sure that there's a right. level playing field science-based for agricultural products, making sure we're providing support to those who are in conflict, not only immediate support, but you know, giving them the capacity to, uh, you know, to have a sustainable food system going forward, because that's important for those people. It's important for our national security as well. Um, let me conclude by, you know, I mentioned at the top that both of you are pioneers, both the first women elected Senate from each of your states. And I think looking out in the audience, and I'm sure watching online, uh, there are going to be young women who, and girls who, are interested in following your footsteps and learning from your examples. So I would uh, love if you could uh, share some of your advice to what these uh, aspiring girls and, and women who, uh, young women who may want to a career in agriculture or in to be government leaders, what would you, what would you say to them? Let's start with some endurance. Yes, thank you. And again, if you can see her, you can be her. And I think it's important to have those examples out there just really breaking through um, whatever barriers there might be. And the point is to, to get out there and try and encourage young women to just try. Um, I'm not one of those, you know, uh, uh, folks that get down on other women. I think we all should be lifting each other up. I really think that's important to do that. But to encourage others to engage and try something new, to do something different, to break, break through those barriers. You know, De Debbie and I have both come up where we have been the minority, women engaging in agriculture, um, women engaging in the military, women engaging in politics. And if you don't try, you're not going to know. You aren't going to have a seat at the table. 
unless you put yourself out there, you break out of the box that you're in. So I think we need to encourage all women to get out there, whether it, again, is in the, the farm fields across the Midwest, whether it is in the laboratories at our wonderful state universities, uh, whether it is in the arena of politics, you've got to give it a shot. Uh, you will not know unless you give it a shot. So I would just say, women, uh, get yourself out there, get engaged, and let's do it. Go forth and do good things. Well, it's been wonderful to be here with you today. Thank you so much, and, and thank you to Joni as well. You know, I, we both have the first. I mean, I think for many of us, I mean, I have lots of firsts in my life growing up and being involved in, in, uh, in governing and public service. And I've always said, uh, if there's not a second, not a third, then it's called a token. <laughs> so, so we we want the seconds and the thirds and the fourths, and we, we we want this at some point, you know, not to be the debate because women will be running the companies and they're running the agribusiness companies and the presence of the research operations and and the farmers and and so on. And so, to all of you, I would start with just do it. Uh, when I was first getting engaged at the local level, I would never have thought myself to say, you know, I can do that. I'm really qualified. I, I think I could do that. Women always waited to be asked. Yeah. Always waited to be asked. Mm -hmm. And we're finally at a, a spot where women are saying, um, you know, I'd like to do that. I could do that. I'm qualified to do that. So just do it. <laughs> Step up. Have confidence in yourself. If you don't succeed the first time, hey, you know, in life, you're going to probably have a lot of times where you don't succeed the first time. And if you never have that experience, good for you. <laughs> but, but for most of us, you know, you don't always succeed. The question is not whether or not you succeed. It's do you get up? Yeah. Do you get up again mm -hmm. and believe enough in yourself? to try again. And so we are all better off if women are trying, getting up, trying again, succeeding. And uh, as, uh, uh, as Shirley Chisholm said way back when, when she ran for president, he, she said, if there's not a seat at the table for you, bring a folding chair. So I would suggest, hopefully we're beyond folding yes. chairs. Oh, yes. But we, we are at a point where, um, you know, we know we're better off you know, if everybody's at the table. Yeah. And that's what this is about. Yeah. Well, please, everyone, join me in thanking our two senators Thank for you. a fantastic Thank session. You. Thank you. Thank you.